Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. I hope you enjoyed that, all you dads out there with the, your empty threats. Uh, I'm Pastor Zach, and I'm excited to share with you uh, on this Father's Day. Uh, actually, my first Father's Day, so kind of a special time for me to share with you. Uh, but we are in our series, I Am Who You Say I Am. And being Father's Day, uh, we thought what better topic to look at than being a child of God, being a son, a daughter of God, and more specifically, being an heir of God and a co-heir with God. Christ. Uh, we see in Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17, it says this, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received about your adop- brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So we see that we are adopted. We are sons. We are are daughters of God. We are are heirs of God. And and maybe this morning you're here and and maybe you don't have a father. Maybe you had a father and, and he's passed away. Maybe you had a father and he wasn't a very good father. Maybe you have a great father. Wherever you are in that this morning, know that you have a Father in heaven who is a good Father, who has good things in store for you, who wants, who wants you to prosper, who has, who has great things planned for you. But we're, this morning we're looking at being heirs of God. And when we think of the word heir, what's the first thing that, that kind of pops into our mind? Inheritance, right? What do I get? Like, what, what do I get from this? We, we think of an inheritance, and this morning I want to look at a story of inheritance. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, but we're looking at this man named Esau. This man named Esau, and maybe you don't know this, but the name Esau uh, actually means hairy. H-A-I-R-Y, hairy. Like, can you imagine you're pregnant with with a baby, and you go to the hospital, and you don't really have a name picked out yet, and you get to the hospital, and, and out comes the baby, and you're like, well, I, we got to name it Harry. Look at this baby. Like, can you just imagine the ba- what the baby looks like in order for them to name it Harry? Uh, but we see this man named Esau uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. It says this. It says, watch out for the Esau syndrome, trading away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a short-term appetite. You well know how Esau later regretted that impulsive act and wanted God's blessing. But by then it was too late. Tears or no tears. A little context here. We are in the New Testament looking back at the Old Testament of the story about uh, Esau. And this is told as a cautionary tale telling you, watch out for the Esau syndrome. We see that Esau, he made a decision in a moment which in turn affected his future, which he did not like when he got there. But we see that Esau is the grandson of Abraham, right? And Abraham might be one of the most famous, most popular people in the whole Bible. Like, they have songs written about him. You guys know the song, right, from Sunday school? Father Abraham. There we go. See, he's, he's, a, he's a popular guy. We got songs about him. But we see that, that God gave Abraham some massive promises. And one of those promises was that he and his wife Sarah were going to have a baby. The problem was, was that they were very old. Actually, the Bible says that Abraham's body was as good as dead. Like, that's a compliment right there, right? His body's as good as dead. Now, I don't know, if you're single here and you're on, like, some online dating website, whatever that may be, and you're working on your profile, this is not something I would include. Uh, can you just imagine, like, uh, yeah, my name is uh, Corey. Uh, I, I uh, work in marketing. I love to go to the lake, love to jet ski. I got a dog. Oh, and by the way, my body, it's as good as dead. Like, that's not something you want to include. But we see that, that he had a baby even though his body was as good as dead. God fulfilled this promise. But the baby was just the beginning. God said, through this baby will come a great nation, and from that nation will come the Savior of the world, and that, that, his, uh, that, his, that he'd have descendants that were more than the number of stars in the sky. And if you're here this morning and you call yourself a Christian, a Christ follower, you are actually a fulfillment of this promise. You are, re- you are referenced right here. But we see that, that he's given these massive promises. So... Abraham had a son named Isaac. Now Isaac receives the birthright. Now Isaac receives all these promises that God gave to Abraham. And then Isaac goes and he has twins, Jacob and Chewbacca. He has these these two twins, and we see that Chewbacca, Esau, was the first one born, uh, meaning that now Esau receives the birthright. 
meaning he gets twice as much of the inheritance as Jacob, meaning that, that he gets all the promises that God has for the family, meaning that the Savior of the world was going to come through his bloodline. The problem is, is that he never saw any of these things happen. Actually, a few hundred years later, when God introduces himself to Moses, he says, I'm the father of Abraham, Isaac, and not Esau, but his brother Jacob. He should have said, I'm the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, but we see that Esau traded away his birthright to his brother Jacob. And you're thinking, thinking like, well, what, what could you get? Like, can you imagine? This has got to be a pretty sweet deal. Like, you're giving up twice as much money. You're giving up all these promises. You're giving up the Savior of the world coming through your bloodline. What do you get for that? And Jacob came up with a sweet deal. Jacob said, how about this? You trade me your birthright, I give you a bowl of soup. And what, what Esau should have said is, are you kidding me? You want me to give you twice as much money. You want me to give you everything that God has promised me for a bowl of soup? But in a moment, he made a decision, which in turn affected his future, which he did not like when he got there. Esau never got to experience these things. He gave them away to his brother Jacob willingly. We see that Esau, he was out hunting. Esau was the type where he's like, I want to go out. I want to kill it, eat it, and wear it. That was just the type of guy Esau was. And, and he was out, and he had an unsuccessful day hunting. So he comes home, and, and he walks into the house, and he smells this delicious soup. So Esau was that way. Jacob was more the style, uh, more the type of person where he, he sits at home, uh, looks up some soup recipes on Pinterest, and then tries them out. Okay, so we see that these are two very different brothers. So Esau walks in, and he smells this soup cooking. He's like, hey, brother Jacob, I want some of that soup. Actually, the translation is this. I want to swallow that. Like, you're just going to swallow your food? You're not even going to chew your food? Like, just to add to Esau, right? I want to swallow that, right? And, and he comes in, and, and then that's when Jacob comes up with this deal. Jacob realized he had a moment, and Esau traded away everything for a temporary desire. Now, we could spend all morning, it would be pretty easy for me to spend all morning talking about how dumb is Esau, right? Like this hairy Chewbacca guy that doesn't chew his food, he just swallows it. Who, who trades away everything God has for him for a bowl of soup. How dumb is this guy? And we could sit here and just roast him all day. But I think what would be more beneficial for us this morning is for me to admit to you that I'm capable of doing in minutes what I would regret for decades. That you are capable of doing in minutes what you would regret for decades. And for you to realize that there's somewhere in some kitchen the enemy is cooking up a pot of soup for you and it'll be served at just the right time. And it'll be served at just the right time. It'll be ladled into a bowl served with culinary perfection. And in that moment when you smell that bowl of soup, you'll feel like all of your happiness is attached to that bowl of soup. In that moment when you smell that, you'll feel like all of your joy, the only way that you can ever find joy is if you take what he's offering you. And understand that, that he has something that he's offering you, but it's, a, it's just a counterfeit. And after we take that bowl, what we realize is that it leaves us feeling worse than we had before, and now we have a whole new set of problems because of what we just did. So all throughout this series of, of talking about I am who you say I am, we're looking at the truth of what God tells us and the lie that's Satan. So we're talking about being a co-heir with Christ. And the first lie that I want to present to you this morning is this, is that Satan tells us this, there's something better out there for you. There's something better out there for you. We see this with all the way back to, to Eve, right, in the garden. And he says, God's just holding out on you. He knows that if you do this, you'll be, a, you'll be just as good as him. He, he's saying, God's holding out on you. Like, look at this. You could do this. God's got, there's, there's better stuff than what God's offering you. That's the first lie that he gives us. There's something better for you. As I'm sure all of you saw this uh, table up here this morning, and uh, I know it's, it's in the morning, but what better time to eat soup than the morning, right? Like some morning soup. We all love morning soup. Uh, but I got some soup cooking up here, and actually I have a, a friend that's going to come up here this morning. Dave Grimm, can you come on up here this morning? I, got, I, you, I looked at you this morning, and you just looked hungry. I was like, you know what, he needs some soup. So uh, I, I got this soup here for you, uh, and uh, I got some candles that, you know, I'll go ahead and light. You can tuck that in. Uh, give it up for Dave coming up this morning. I mean, it's not Chick-fil-A, but it is chicken wild rice soup, so I at least included some chicken. I just, I just tore up some Chick-fil-A Chick nuggets and, and put it in there. So you just go ahead. You dig in. You enjoy it. It's so good. There may be Chick-fil-A sauce in there. Uh, you all right, Dave? What is that? What did we find in, in Dave's soup but a nasty little crawfish in that soup? 
I'm sorry, Dave. I love you. I love you, Dave. Thank you. you I mean, if you want to eat, take a bite, you can take a bite. Oh, there you go. Get up for Dave. But can you imagine if you were sitting there this morning and you're, you're kind of cold and kind of shivering and you're hungry and all of a sudden you, that soup, like you smell that soup. And, and you know that soup, it's just going to warm you up and it's going to feel so good to eat that. It'll just warm you up and it'll, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fill up your tummy because you're so hungry. And you start eating some of the soup only to get a few bites in and realize that there's something that you weren't expecting at the bottom of that bowl of soup. This is what Satan offers us. He offers us something that in the moment, it seems so good. In the moment, it seems like it's everything we want, that, that it's exactly what we need. But in the end, it'll leave you regretting it. If Dave would have taken a couple bites of this, as he walked on the stage, he'd be like, I've never listened to what Pastor Zach tells me to do again. Like, he, he would regret it. He'd say, why, why did I ever do that? I can't believe it. I feel so disgusting. I, I don't want to ever do that again. And that's what Satan offers us. He offers us a counterfeit, something that seems good at the beginning, but in the end it just leaves us regretting it. In the end it just feels, uh, leaves us feeling disgusting. So even though we can know that we are heirs of God, even though we can know that, that we are co-heirs with Christ, the moment, in that moment what Satan offers us can seem so great. It can seem like it's everything that we want. It seems, and it might even seem better in that moment than what God has for our future. But what you need to recognize this morning is that you have desires. That we, that we have these earthly desires, and that desires can keep you from your destiny. Your desires right now can keep you from your destiny. We see that Esau, he had a desire, a desire for food. Desire is desire. Desire is not wrong. What you do with it can be. Your desires, can, they can keep you from your destiny. The temporary keeps us from the eternal. And in the time that it takes to, to swipe a screen, in the time it takes to click on a link, to click on a video, to tell that lie, to take that extra cash, Satan's already been working in us, and it leaves us uh, feeling worse. And all we can do in minutes can leave us regretting it for decades. We're capable of doing this. But sometimes this can be hard because sometimes we wonder, well, is this God offering this to me? Or, or, is, this, or is this Satan's counterfeit? Like, how do, I, how do I know the difference here? Here's what I tell you. Fill yourself up with what is good. Fill yourself up with what is good. Because when your stomach is empty, your standards get lower. That's why it's dangerous to go grocery shopping when you're hungry. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? I remember when Maren was pregnant, and it would be like midnight, and she'd send me to Hy-Vee to go get some milk. I'd be like, okay, I can go get some milk, and I'd be getting the milk. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden I walk by ice cream, I'm like, ice cream sounds so good right now. I get some ice cream. You know what would be good with ice cream? Some Oreos. Yeah, that would be good with some ice cream, some Oreos. And you know what? I should probably eat a full meal before I just jump to dessert, right? So I'll go get some high V Chinese or maybe a steak to grill up. It's like midnight. And I just get all these things. I need, I need drinks. I need, I need some pop. I, I get all this stuff. And I originally went just to go get a gallon of milk. And what do you know? I got a full cart full of a bunch of junk food. But how many know that if I had filled myself up with, with, with meat, with vegetables, with fruits, if I'm drinking lots of water, I'm not going to want junk food. I'm not going to want candy. I'm not going to want pop, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you drink lots of water, you don't want pop as much, right? Fill yourself up with what is good. It's the same way spiritually. Fill yourself up with what is good so that, would, so that when the, the negative, when the bad is presented to you, you say, I don't, need, I don't want that. We see that, that Jacob presented this to Esau when he was hungry. It was a long day. It was a long hunt. It was an unsuccessful day of hunting. I don't think Jacob would have been successful in this if uh, they were sitting at the breakfast table and eating their Cheerios together, and Jacob realized, like, oh, Esau just got done with bowl one of Cheerios. Hey, Esau, I got a deal for you, bro. Uh, how about I go get you another bowl of Cheerios, and you give me your birthright? No, he would have, like, slapped him and given him a wedgie, just like any older brother would, right? He would have said, like, no, that's a bad deal. No, thank you. But we see that when your stomach is empty, your standards get lower. This, this deal was offered to him when he was at his lowest, when, when, when he was hungry, when, when he wasn't filling himself up with, with other good things. We need to be listening to our calling. We need to be listening to what God says about us. Because when we know what God says about us, we can tune out what the world thinks about us. When we know what God says about us, we can tune out what the world thinks about us. Have you ever been so full that, that good food sounded bad? You know what I'm talking about? Like, so full that it's like, I couldn't eat another bit. Have you ever heard of uh, Fogo de Chao? It's this fancy restaurant, right? Uh, if you don't know about it, it's this, like, fancy Brazilian restaurant, all you can eat. And maybe you're thinking, like, how does fancy and all you can eat go together? Well, it does. I don't know how it works. But it's this, it's this nice place where you go and you sit down, and it's, like, all you can eat meat. 
They're just like constantly bringing you good meat to your table. Uh, there's an all-you-can-eat salad bar, but don't worry about that because it's just a waste of space. Like don't even, don't even look at it. Uh, but they just bring meat to your table. And what they do is they give you this little card. And one side is green and the other side is red. If green is up, it means like bring on the food. I want to eat more. Keep bringing the food to my table. If red is up, it's like I don't want food anymore. Well, Pastor Luke and I and Pastor Brian and, and Jamie and Jenna, we went out to eat there uh, one night. And the, Pastor Luke and I's problem is we don't know how to flip it back over to the red side. It just stays on green all the time. So they just continue bringing food and food. And I just keep eating it and eating it. Let me tell you, meat sweats are real. Okay? <laughs> they, they, it's a real thing. It's, it's not fake. But I kid you not, I got to the point where I was laying down and I'm still just like laying on the table just shoveling food into my mouth. Like I, I'm getting every little bit that I can. But finally, after I, like, if the meat was so far up that I just, like, couldn't eat anymore, at that point, finally, they rolled me out of the restaurant. And uh, if they would have, in that moment, said, hey, you want to go get some Cold Stone? I would have just thrown up, just, like, thinking about it, because I was so full. But, but know this, I love ice cream, and I love Cold Stone. It's, like, the, it's the best, all right? But if they would have said that in the moment, like, you want to go get some, <clears throat> like, I, it would have it just been bad, because I was so full. But can you imagine if this is where we were spiritually? Where we filled ourselves up so much with God, so much with His Word, that when something else is offered to us that isn't as good for us, we just throw up God right back at it. Right? We just spit out the, the verses, right? How, how did Jesus beat temptation? Verse after verse after verse. What if that's where we were? We were so full of God that everything that comes out of our mouth is just another verse countering what Satan has to offer us. Fill yourself up with what is good so that you will know what is bad. So you aren't hungry for what is bad. So we see the first slide is, there's something better for you. Yeah, God offered you this, but guess what? There's something better. He's holding out for you. After we've bought into that lie, after we've done what Satan's offered us, he, offered, he, he then presents the second lie to us. It's this, you've messed up too bad. You've messed up too much. Like, like, I can't believe, and he says, I can't believe you ever did that. Like, God can't forgive you. Look at what you did. You've messed up too much for God to forgive you. So first he tells us, do this. Then he says, says to us, I can't believe you ever did that. Like, you're so messed up. This morning we're looking at how, how God is our Father. And throughout the Bible we see that Father and Shepherd are kind of used back and forth. Just like everyone has a Father, everyone has a Shepherd. There's no such thing as a shepherdless sheep. Right? Sheep, if you know anything about sheep, they do not survive. They do not thrive in the wild. They'll actually die from eating too much good food. Like they just like, almost like me at Fogo, like they just eat so much and their stomach explodes. Luckily I didn't get to that point, hallelujah. But we see that everyone has a father, everyone has a shepherd, everyone has someone who's leading you, who's guiding you. So I asked you this morning, who leads you? Who, who guides you? Everyone has a shepherd. And one thing that we see with shepherds, we see that, that God's a shepherd and we are the sheep, but one thing we see with shepherds is ownership. They have ownership over their sheep, why? Because number one, God has ownership over us because, number one, he made you, right? Any parents here know, like, you have ownership over your kid because you made them, right? I, can, I brought you into the world. I can take you out of it, right? We see that, that God has ownership over us because, number one, he made you, and number two, he paid for you. Number one, he made you, and number two, he paid for you. He has ownership of us. And at first, this idea of ownership is something that we reject. It's something that we're like, I, I don't know if I want ownership. Why? Because when we think of being owned, we don't, we don't want someone else telling us what to do. We don't want to be a slave to someone else. That, that doesn't sound good. But really, when you look deep down, when you think about it, this is one of our deepest desires is to be owned. Why? Because nobody washes a rental car. What do I mean? Out in the parking lot is my truck that I paid for. You better believe that I all the time am clean, cleaning up garbage, vacuuming out, which means every time Pastor Luke gets in my car, I got to clean it out again. Uh, but, but I'm cleaning up garbage. I'm taking, my car, I'm taking my truck to the car wash. I'm getting oil changes on it. I'm putting new tires on it. Never once have I had a rental car and thought, you know what? This car, I, I think this car could use some new tires. I'm just going to go put some new tires on I'm, I'm just going to go take this car through the car wash, right? I, I've never once done that. No one washes a rental car. But hear me, God is not going to treat you badly. Why? Because he's bought into you. He's not going to treat you badly. He's bought into you. He's paid for you. He's made you. And he cares about you. He cares about how you're doing. He cares about your future. He, he knows what is best for you. And did you know that shepherds, they, act, they also actually name their sheep? They have names for their sheep. And, and, and John talks about how, how he knows the name of his sheep, which is awesome because that means that you're not just another face in the crowd. 
You're not just another person out there. God knows you. He knows your name. But also throughout the Bible, we see that he's not afraid to change people's names. Abraham, Abraham, Saul, Paul, right? He, he's not afraid to change your name. And maybe this morning you came in here and you've been given a name by the world. You're dumb. You're stupid. You're lazy. You are no good. You are not wanted. You, you're, you're the worst person, right? But God says, no, you are bold. You are courageous. You are chosen. You are, you are beautiful. You are worth knowing. You are worth having. You are worth waiting for. God is not afraid to change your name. Don't listen to what the world says about you. When we listen to what God says about us, what God knows about us, we can tune out what the world thinks about us. Here's the other awesome thing about God is he's good even when you're not. God is good even when you're not. Throughout the Bible, when we read the Bible, we see that the shepherd leaves the 99 to find the one, right? He's not like, well, I've still got 99 sheep, right? Percentages. It's all about percentages, Right? That's kind of how you feel if you've ever been to kids camp before. You have like your 10 kids. I know it's because I was just there. You have like your 10 kids, and you're constantly counting to make sure they're all there. Maybe one's in the bathroom, and you're like, nah, 9 out of 10 percentages, right? Like if I come back with 9 of the <laughs> But we see that that's, that's not true, right? It, you don't just be like, oh, one's gone. I've, I've still got 90% here. No, he leaves the 99 to find the one. He, 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 Luke 15 says that. He leaves the 99 to find the one. If I had four quarters in my hand right now, and I was to lose one of those quarters. How many know that that quarter that I lost is just as valuable to me as the three quarters that are in my hand? Just because it's lost does not mean it's lost its value. There's some people in here this morning, there's, there's people in your life, some family members, some neighbors, some coworkers who are lost, but hear me this morning, if you are lost, if you have someone that's lost, just because you are lost does not mean you have lost your value. You have value. God has given you value. It's like, it's like this $100 bill right here. Right, I just got all the youth's attention. They're like, this $100 bill right here, right? We know that, that this is worth $100. Why? Because it was stamped and it was sealed and given a value by the government saying this piece of paper is worth $100. Now, it doesn't matter what I do with this $100 bill. I could crumple it up. I could throw it on the ground. I could stomp on it, right? It doesn't matter what people say about this $100 bill. It doesn't matter who's touched this $100 bill. It doesn't even matter what this was used for in the past. What matters is that it was stamped and sealed and given a value by the government saying this is worth $100. Your life is like this $100 bill. Maybe you've been thrown on the ground. Maybe you've been stomped on. Maybe you've been passed around. Maybe you've been used and abused. But God says, no, you are valuable. I have given you your value. You are my son. You are my daughter. And you've been ma made in the image of God. You have value. God... Jesus leaves the 99 to find the one. Your shepherd is calling your name, not to accuse you, not, not to condemn you, not to judge you or criticize you, but to say, come back to me. Come back to restoration. Come back to life. Come back to the family. I've got good things for you. You are my heir. Come receive your inheritance. The last thing that we see that keeps us from fully being able to receive our inheritance is, is this, is that we feel like I just can't hang on. Like, I want to obey God, I want to follow what God says, and I want to do what He wants, but I, I just can't hang on to it. Like, I'm trying my hardest, but I'm not strong enough. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 28 says this, My sheep, they listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Check this out. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will will snatch them out of my hand. Being that it's Father's Day today, I thought what better person to bring up to help me than the one who made me a father, right? This is Barrett Michael Hill. Say hello. Say hello. This is Barrett. He's eight months old. Uh, he was not feeling the best the last couple days, but I talked to him, and he's like, yeah, you can still use me, Dad. That's fine, <laughs> right? Can you say Dad, Dad? He's never done it before. I thought it would be kind of cool if he did it this service. <laughs> you guys want to see one of his tricks here? All right, ready for this, buddy? You ready? Oh, yeah. That would have been so bad if I dropped him on live stream. But we see that, that, that God says, no one can snatch you out of my grip. And so many times we feel like, I'm not strong enough. I'm not strong enough to, to, to hang on with God. Well, look at this. It's cute. Are you going to throw up? <laughs> it's cute when, when he holds on to my finger 
It's cute when he holds on to my shirt, but how many know that I'm not trusting his grip on me, I'm trusting my grip? It's not about, it's not about his grip staying in my arms. He's not the one keeping himself in my arms because if I was to let go, he's just gonna fall down, right? It, <laughs> now he holds on. It's not about his grip. God says, I'm not trusting your grip, I'm trusting mine. It's cute when he can stand up over here and he stands up and tries to dance or whatever. It's cute when he does that, but I'm not trusting his ability to stay standing. I'm trusting me. I'm trusting my strength to hold him up. He's smiling for everybody. This is, this is God with us as a father, right? Any father is not gonna just let their child fall. They're gonna hold on to him. They're gonna keep them safe. They're gonna protect him. God cares about you. He's not trusting your grip. He's not trusting in your ability. He's not saying it's about what you can do. He's saying it's about what I've already done. There you go, mom. Give it up for Barrett. He says it's not about what you can do. It's not about your own strength. It's about mine. Don't worry, I I'm taking care of it. I've got you in my arms. No one can snatch you out of my hands. So we see that, that Satan tells us these lies. Number one, that there's something better for you. There's something better. God's holding out on you. There's something better out there for you. And after we bought into that lie, he says, you've messed up too much. God can't forgive you for that. But here's the truth this morning. You are an heir of God no matter what. No matter what. No one can snatch you out of his hands. God's full of grace, and he's saying, come back to me. Come back to life. He's chasing you down. He leaves the 99 to find the one. You have value. You are made in the image of God. He's not going to leave you. He's not going to let bad things happen to you. He has big things in store for your life. He cares about you. He's saying, come, receive your inheritance. What's our inheritance? It's simple, heaven. Heaven. That someday we get to be with him in heaven. Someday we get to be in a place of no weeping, no hurt, no pain, no tears. We get to be in heaven with Jesus celebrating. Come receive your inheritance. And maybe this morning you're saying, well, Pastor Zach, you're saying that, that God wants to be with me, right? You're saying that, that God wants to forgive me, that he chases me down, right? So if, if God wants to be with me, if, if he wants to forgive me, can't I just do whatever I want and then just ask him for forgiveness? Say, I mean, I mean you could. But think of it this way. Uh, forgiveness and consequences are two different things. I can go out this afternoon, not that I'm gonna do this, uh, and I can go and kill someone this afternoon. And yes, God can forgive me, but how many know I'm still gonna face some consequences? Yes, God can forgive you, but he would much rather be blessing you. We spend so much time saying, I just want, I just, I, I'm gonna ask God for forgiveness, I'm gonna do this and ask God for forgiveness. What if we just didn't need to ask for forgiveness and we just were asking for blessings? God wants to bless you as a father. He wants to bless you and bless you and bless you. He doesn't want to just sit there and forgive you. Yes, he will forgive you, but he would much rather be blessing you. If you'd stand all across this room this morning as I get ready to close out this time. Here's what I want to encourage you this morning is, is fill yourself up with what is good. Fill yourself up with what is good so you can recognize the counterfeit, so, so you can see what, is, what Satan's offering you as the counterfeit, and you won't have a desire to have that. Yes, you have desires, but you don't have to, fulfill, you don't have to follow those desires. God's got big things for you. So many times we, we, look, at, we look at the line and say, well, where's the line of, of where, I, where I can be with God? And where's that line of like, if I cross it, then I'm, I'm going to hell, then that line. And so many times we focus on what can I do to, to still be here? Well, let's, how about this? How about we stop focusing on how close to the line can I get and start focusing on how close to God can I get? How far away to that, of the, from that line can I get? Fill yourself up with what is good. God's got good things for you. He leaves the 99 to find the one. He's chasing you down. You have value. You have been made in the image of God. You are his son. You are his daughter. We have a father that is good and has good things for you. If you bow your head this morning, your inheritance is heaven. God has blessings for you. But I ask you this, will you give up the right now for the later? Because now yells louder, but later lasts longer. Now yells so much louder, but later I promise you will last longer. Will you give up the now for the later? 
As you're in this place this morning, maybe, maybe you're hearing some of this for the first time and you're hearing about a God who loves you and wants to forgive you and wants to do life with you and wants to show you grace and forgiveness and have blessings for you and you're saying, I want that. What you're talking about, I want that. I, I don't know what that is or maybe you do know what that's like, but, but it's been a long time since you've experienced it and today you're saying, I wanna come back to that. I wanna come back to that grace. I wanna come back to that love. I wanna come back to his open arms. I wanna stop trusting in what I can do and start trusting in what he's already done that's you this morning saying, I want to accept Jesus in my life and begin living for him. With no one looking around, would you just raise your hand? Saying, that's me. See your hand. See your hands. The second thing I want to hit on this morning is this, is that you know what God has for you. Maybe you know God's plans, but maybe you've been buying into uh, Satan's counterfeit. You've been buying into those lies. And this morning, you want to make a commitment saying, from this moment on, I want to fill myself up with what is good. And I want to make a commitment that every day I want to begin reading my Bible. I want to spend time in prayer. So much so that I'm so full of God that whatever comes out of my mouth, whatever comes out in, in a conversation is it, directed straight towards God. It is, is praises towards Him. That I, can, that I can counter any temptation with a Bible verse. That, I, that I'm not going to fall into Satan's schemes. That I'm not going to take that bowl of soup that he's offering me. And today you want to make a commitment saying, I'm going to begin filling myself up with what is good. If that's you, would you raise your hand? My hand is up on this one. I want to fill myself up with what is good every single day. So here's what I want to do to close today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a prayer, and if, if that's you and you raised your hand and you want to respond with, and someone pray with you, if you'll come down here to the front and our prayer team can, can come and pray with you. But before we leave this morning, before we go out to lunch for Father's Day and celebrate our, our dads, I just want to spend a few minutes in worship, just worshiping God because He is so good, because it, it's not about us. It's not about how bad I've been. It's not about how good I've been that, that I can worship. It's about how good God always is. So we're gonna spend some time in worship and, and prayer. And if you want prayer, you can come up to the front. Uh, if, you want, if you want to come to the altars, you can come up there to pray. But let's not rush out this morning. Let's, let's spend some time with our Father, being that it's Father's Day, giving Him the praise He deserves. Dear Jesus, God, I thank you for every person in here this morning, God. I thank you that, that you have them here on purpose for a purpose, God. I thank you that you have plans for us, God. I thank you that, that we are heirs of yours, God, that we are children of yours, that, that we have value, that you made us in your image, that you love us, that we're not just another face in the crowd, God, but, but we are your son, we are your daughter, God. I pray that every person here would know your love for them, God, that they would not leave here not, not experiencing that love, that they would leave here fully engulfed in your love, God, fully embracing your love, God. I pray that we would fill ourselves up with what is good every day, God, that we'd spend time in worship, we'd spend time in prayer, in our word every day, God, that this church would be a church that's on fire for your name, God, that, that we would leave this place ready to go in our, into our communities, ready to go into our families, ready to, to go into work, to reach lost people, recognizing that they have a Father that loves them, recognizing that just because they are lost does not mean they have lost their value, that you value them, Jesus. I pray you give us a heart for the lost. I pray you give us a heart to know you more, God. Fill us up this morning. Let's experience something new. I thank you for every person who responded to your name, God, accepting you into their life, God. I pray that they would begin to take the steps they need to make the changes they need, God, to, to come closer to you, God. I thank you. It's not about what we can do. It's about what you have already done. We give you this time. We give you the worship. Speak to us this morning, we pray. Amen.